Doing pretty good. I think this is our first face to face, huh? For sure. Um, yeah, I mean, there's there's so many people that I know I've met uh through um check check check. So many people I've met through social media over the years that I'm actually like I guess on an intellectual, political, socially conscious level, I'm really close with them. I'm more close with them than like the people in my everyday lives, right? who don't understand me, right? Like I'm a, I'm a fucking yeah. unicorn to them. <laughs> but the, a few people online, like we're kindred spirits. Like we kind of, even if we don't agree on things, we get each other, right? Yeah. And that's the best thing about social media. <laughs> yeah. Well, especially like when you write, you know what I mean? Because you're kind of like locked away writing. Uh, you know, sometimes you're, you know, you're, your family loves you, but you know, they also don't, they're not <laughs> part of that. Uh all the time, you know. Yeah, so. I mean, are you the are you the only nerd in your family? <laughs> yeah. yeah, pretty much, pretty much, yeah. Yeah, same here, you know. And so, you know, my grandma thinks would always think she still thinks I'm sick. Something's wrong with me, papi. <laughs> no, 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 te sales. You know, you can't be reading all time. It's bad for you. You know, she's like, <laughs> she thinks I'm like a cutter or something. I'm like, no, I'm reading. You know, I'm reading good books here, man. She's like. Mm, papi, no. <laughs> my mom after uh like coursework when i was in graduate school you know you just start dissertating so you read and write and every single time i talked to her every day she'd be like oh did you go to class today Miko?" and i'm like no mom i haven't gone in like two and a half years that's, that's not what i do you know <laughs> like what do you do again you you're a tattoo yeah. artist or something <laughs> yeah more or less yeah well, uh, thank you so much for coming on. I mean, it's it's. Uh, I'm really excited to have you on. Uh, just I just heard the Latino Rebels appearance yes, uh, that you had yesterday. Uh, my ears were ringing, um, but it's been good. You know, I, I'm so excited to bring you on because, like, like you guys rehash on Latino Rebels. I mean, I edited your stuff what like five years ago. Um, you had or you still have a site, Cuentos and Comentarios, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Comment hearing. Yeah, commentary and cuentos. Oh, to commentary and cuentos. Yeah, sorry, and uh, I mean, you, you probably feel you know. First of all, uh, introduce yourself. I'm I'm terrible at. I don't know why I have a podcast. I don't know why anybody let me have a podcast because I'm a terrible host. But uh, introduce yourself for everybody and let them know uh, what you do and about the book, and then we can get started. Yeah, so I'm Aaron Sanchez. I'm a history professor at. Uh, it's now called Dallas College here in in, in Dallas, Texas. Um, I'm a Latino Rebels contributor. Uh, that's how we met uh, when you were an editor there. Or I guess met in in quotations. Yeah, e-met. Right? Uh, they say e-met. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, e-met. Um, and I'm the author of uh, the book Homeland: Ethnic Mexican Belonging Since 1900, which is out of the University of Oklahoma Press. Um, and yeah, it's it's been a work in progress, and I'm I'm excited that it's finally out. How long did it take you? The, the book is, you know, really uh, a history of what the 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 cultural and political consciousness of Mexicans in the United States during the 20th century. Right. I mean, um, yeah. So, yeah. And, so, and, 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 yeah. And, and in that light, just, just quickly, what I wanted to say in that light, as a Puerto Rican Honduran, you know, I got a lot of insights. Right. Because, you know, it's a cliche and we all know about it. But like, you know, if you're Latino in America, you're Mexican to the non-Latino. Right. <laughs> And so what happens to Mexicans and how they navigate that, their identity, is pertinent information to all the rest of us Latinos, right? Um, and so, and like you mentioned with Julio yesterday, how Julio mentioned, as a Puerto Rican, I know what it's like to belong to a place, belong to the idea of a place, not actually the physical land. Um, but uh, sorry to cut you off. How, how long did it take? I mean, it, it seemed like... It took uh, a long time. You, you've read a lot of books. I mean, you reference a lot of books. I'm, I'm thinking like, okay, I got to read that. I got to read that. I'm like putting the book down every time and like, I got to read that. I got to read that. And uh, and the prose though, you know, it's an academic book. It's kind of like a textbook, but it's not as in, as in um, that is to say, it's going to be read, I assume, in colleges and his, in high schools. Uh, but it's very, the writing is very accessible because you have that experience of writing for the general public. Yeah, I, I started, um, I, I revised the dissertation. So the dissertation, I, I began uh, at, at SMU, which is here in Dallas, back in, in 07, uh, and I finished in 2013. Um, and so I, I was writing that for probably 
three, uh, researching, writing for three, four years um, or so and doing some coursework leading up to that. And then I got out and, uh, you know, it was trying to figure out what to do. I, I, I wasn't sure. I was kind of burned out on the topic. Um, I, if, if you read the dissertation compared to, to, to this book, I mean, the way that I was writing was, was uh, really heavy handed jargon and, and, and overly academic because I thought that's what, what you had to do. Um, and so I, I was kind of burned out and, and, and beaten down from graduate school. Uh, and I was like, man, what am I doing? And then that's when I started thinking, I, I, you know, I, I like writing. And so, uh, you know, my wife, my partner, she is great. And she was like, well, you know, start a blog. And, I, and if I was good at technology, right, I wouldn't be a historian. I was like, well, I don't know how to do that. And yeah, so right. <laughs> she helped me set it up. And then I started randomly blogging. And that's how I started connecting, I think, with you and who you and, and you guys were like, yo, pitch uh, Latino rebels. And I was like, all right. Yeah. <laughs> and then I started writing for that. And I was like, oh, wait, yeah, like writing matters, writing is important. That's why I shouted you out in the acknowledgements. Because thank it, you. It thank you so me. much. Yeah, like that, that, that helped me get back uh, to really enjoying writing, right? To, to enjoying ideas um, and, and uh, kind of remembering how important uh, what we do as writers uh, does, you know, th th that's important. So I wrote quite a bit for those popular audiences. I learned how not to write bad as an <laughs> academic <laughs> for good or for, for better or worse right I, I, I haven't gotten the academic reviews back on this thing but you know uh i can imagine some academics might not appreciate that it's not overly academic um but uh yeah so so i was able really to is that is that will that be uh, you know i'm not in academia but that is that a complaint that you're not writing in enough academies it it could be, um, it could be faulted for that, and and, and it's brevity, right? It's 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 since nineteen hundred. No, they're just haters, only... man. Every academic <laughs> wants to write for an accessible way. They just can't write. Like difficult writing, difficult reading means it that what's the saying, right? Easy reading is hard writing. Mm -hmm. So, like, if the if the if it seems like oh man, this person is just talking. No, that's a really good writer. And it's actually the very bad writers who use the, the t like I was saying on Facebook the other day, you know, when it's, when I start, when I'm writing and the $10 words start coming out, it's time to quit writing for the day. Cause that's when I'm not trying to boil it down. I'm just throwing my big, I rely, I'm relying on my big words and complicated syntax. Let me add a semicolon there. It looks great. Uh, but that's, that's easy. That's actually easier than writing simply. Yeah. Yeah, those simple. I mean, that's writing for Latino rebels and, and that wider audience was it. It it showed me. It, it reminded me how uh, impactful simple simple sentences can be. Right, just a simple sentence, not compound, not complex. Yeah, not end dashes and yeah. semicolons like you were saying. A simple sentence uh, that I I didn't write with that many simple sentences before. And there were some t difficult topics. Uh, I think I, I remember writing a Latino Rebels piece that was looking at um, the, the physical costs, like the health costs of deportation policy. Uh, and, and my first sentence, I, I kept writing and rewriting. It was this long like paragraph one. And oh, now I'm going to forget what I settled on. But I think I said like deportation policies are hurting, uh, I think, migrants and oh i'm gonna forget it now right but it was just but front center simple, right yeah, like yeah. yeah very simple sentence saying these are physically punishing and hurting people right uh and and it, it was it, there was no tiptoeing around it anymore yeah. right there's there's no making it sound detached or better or worse that was harsh right in front of you you know it hits you uh really hard um and so, yeah, writing for that audience really helped me return to, to this kind of academic book and say, hey, maybe I can write it a little bit better where folks can can pick it up and, and try to let the, again, when you're reporting or, or doing things with, with journalism, right, is you, you also let the quotes, you let the people you're interviewing speak right. for themselves or tell the story. And so that's a little bit of what I tried to do with those primary sources. You know, some of those quotations that I had is, is put them up there and let uh, let those people uh, from the time period push 
um, let, let their voice be heard and, and push the argument. And of course, I have to do some of the contextualizing right. and analyzing. Um, but yeah, try to put some of those quotes, which are really good. Uh, that, that, that is what drove my interest in this in this topic. Um, but being able to feature those. It's a it's a big book in a little book, you know what I mean? Because it's like two two hundred and something pages, right? Or one hundred seventy one pages to the end of the conclusion, um, not counting the acknowledgments and the introduction and everything. Um, and you know, if I'm being honest, like you know, sometimes you, as I get books all the time, to, you know, read my book, and there's some usually one chapter in there that's good, or a couple chapters in there that's good. And sometimes I get books that are collections of essays, so they're different writers writing on a a major theme and there's one good essay, one great essay. And I was, you know, expecting, I read the first uh, chapter, which you start in the 1900s, right? Right before the, right around, right before the, the Mexican revolution, talking about Mexicanism. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, Oh, that was a great, I read it. I'm like, Oh, this is great. You know? And I'm like, Oh, that's probably going to be, you know, a lot of writers start (laughs) with their best chapter, right? This is great. And then it sags, but no, then you go to like the detachment of Mexican, uh, identity in the 20s away from the land and then it's just every chapter then you're talking about leftism then you're talking about the chicana movement then you're talking about fem- then you end on feminism or uh, the conclusion is you know the, the the identity since then right since the 70s and so it's a book you really can't put down and and you you pull quotes from not only you know uh, actual quotes from people but you quote poetry great poetry great dialogue from from novels and stories and stuff like that it's just it's a great book it's a really good book and and uh it it really shows i mean what what do you think you know when i when i go to write something i have an idea of what i what i mean to say but then i write it and then i'm like oh that's what i meant to say or there's meanings in it that i didn't even realize but looking back oh that's what i meant what did you mean to do before you wrote this? And looking back at it now, what do you think it means? Yeah, well, thanks. I want to thank you for those those compliments, right? <laughs> I was hoping that, that that it would be that thing, and so it, it feels really good, you know. And, and I'm humbled for, for for you to say that it, I somewhat succeeded in making it accessible and interesting. So, so thank you for that. Um, you know, um, the. Yeah, I, I, I liked all these ideas um, and trying to approach them. I think I lost my train of <laughs> there. After. Like, can you remind yeah, me of you, your you see like a, You see, yeah, it happens to me all the time. I see like, okay, what I would mean to say is down there in that okay. pit, but do I want to go down in that pit? And it's Friday afternoon. And, you know, that's the other problem with this show is that I do it, fr- I record Friday afternoons and people are like spent, you know, by Friday. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what you know? What did you mean to say? What did you? What were you trying to do with the book before you wrote it, or as you were writing it? And now looking back, what do you think is the main takeaway from it? Yeah. Okay. Thanks, thanks for reminding <laughs> me. Sorry about that. Well, you know, I think I got there. So as a as an undergrad, um, I was a, I was a history major, but a lot of my studies were actually like in cultural studies, right? Um, and so I liked history. Uh, I hadn't read as 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 much into uh what i do now right and so when i got to graduate school uh i was i was deep into kind of cultural studies american studies that kind of field and then i was like okay well now i got to be more historical right um <laughs> and so i didn't know intellectual history was a field right that that probably sounds bad as someone going into graduate school and and not knowing you know the the field he now says he's in even existed yeah. Uh, until my advisor was like, you know what you're doing? It's, it's, it's a history of ideas. And at that point I was like, oh my goodness, right? Like my head exploded. Like, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to do a history of ideas. That makes sense now. Like, cause before I was trying to think like, okay, when I saw a policy, I'd instantly think of like a line from a novel, you know? And if I'm trying to make an argument about a policy and then I quote a line from a novel, most of the time that doesn't work, right? But now if I shift it and I say, I'm looking at this history of ideas then I can put into conversation, um, you know, these these press releases and these policies and these politics right. and the literature, right? Because I'm looking at, at the ideas of the time. Um, and so that became clearer and clearer the more I worked on it. And then 
becoming more confident in what I was doing, again, came not in the midst of grad school. I became more confident in what I was doing when I was writing for Latino rebels right. and, and those kinds of areas. Cause I was like, Oh man. Yeah. I've got something here. Right. Um, and so I was able to go back and, and kind of trim a lot of the, cause yeah, the dissertation was just kind of this huge, huge mess, right. This, this really <laughs> long mess of a thing. And, and I had to leave a bunch of stuff on the chopping floor. Um, and so I was able to bring those, those ideas, uh, to the forefront and, and focus on belonging, realizing like, Oh, that's, that's the thing, right? Um, that's the piece. Cause going, when I first started, I thought I was going to do like this heavy theoretical thing with space. Um, and I was going to, you know, I was going to talk about like, I was going to connect with like homie Baba, uh, and Lefebvre and, you know, and, and third <laughs> space. And so, you know, my eyes just... started to cross right now. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Like this super theory heavy yeah. thing that, yeah, you'd pick up and you wouldn't, yeah. I mean, it'd be too dense and, 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 and inaccessible. Uh, and I realized like, I don't think I need to do that. It, not that, that that kind of writing isn't important, oh, right? Yeah. It, it certainly serves its purpose, but for the, the, the project that I wanted to do, I thought, no, let's try to do this, this other thing and, and, uh, and hope it works out. And so there was a way that I think I could have theorized belonging, I think, there were some, I got some feedback that wanted me to, to make belonging more theoretical. And, and, and for academics, I think there's, there's probably a good reason for that. Um, I, I didn't want to over theorize belonging in the book though, because I did want to leave it kind of open ended. I, I do talk about it. Um, yeah. but I also wanted to allow a space for all the people who came to the book, whether they're historians, academic, non-academics, to, to, to be able to engage in it in their own way. For me not to say, this is it and this is the only definition. And, and I think I saw that. I, I read your essay uh, just this, this afternoon, oh, right? <laughs> and kind of your response. And that's great. Like, that's what I wanted, right? Like, it, 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 it made folks think like, oh, right? Like, this question of belonging is really important and is very human, uh, like I mentioned in the book. And I really like to see the way that you know, essayists like you and other really smart people that 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 I think highly of engage it in their own way. Uh, so I thought, you know, the, the way that that you responded in your essay was great. I, I thought that was awesome. Well, because I was, you know, essay. you're talking, you're you you let you tell the history, you show the history of what Mexicans themselves thought of what Mexicanness means and the arguments and the debates and how that evolved. And so I'm reading about these Mexicans debating Mexicanism or Mexican Mexicanness. And as I show in my essay, like I had Mexicans and Mexican culture all around me from a very young age. Right. And especially now I'm, you know, like I started the essay, I'm surrounded by Mexicans. And so don't I have some Mexicanness, right? If, if the pochos aren't Mexican enough, then, but they still consider themselves Mexican, then I'm either further removed, but I'm still have some Mexicanness, Mexicanness in me. Right. <laughs> so now it's even detached. Now I'm detaching Mexicanness from bloodline, right? From hair, from actual descendancy, right? Um, and, you know, people are probably going to uh, yell at me for that. One commenter said, you know, translation, he's American, which I liked, you know, because <laughs> if you're American, you have a little Mexicanness in you, right? I mean, Mexicanness, yeah. Mexican culture is a part of American culture. When we think of the American cowboy, we're thinking of the Mexican vaquero. Yeah. And so, um, and it's interesting that you said, you know, the intellectual history. Maybe that's why I liked your book, because I learned uh, at UIC, I'm, I was, I'm a history major, and uh, uh, Diedrich McCluskey, Professor Diedrich McCluskey, she's a, a famous, uh, well, well-respected economist, U University of Chicago, UIC. She taught me my history writing class. And what she, what she is is an intellectual historian. She writes books about... Uh, she tries to show that uh, bourgeois ideas and culture came first before capitalism. It led to capitalism. And so she tries to show, you know, she go, she's very, you know, going into the 1300s, 1400s, 1500s, showing how they're talking about bourgeois values and how it led to capitalism. And uh, and so, I, you know, I, I the history of ideas, I mean... Uh, I, I told with the idea of going to, you know, the, there's that program at U University of Chicago, the, the social thought program, mm -hmm. which is the history of ideas. Right. 
Um, and I think people like that. I think that's more of a, rather than debating theory, which is, again, all kind of writing is important, but people want to know, yeah, what were people, th- what did people think about that? And, um, I mean, I don't know where to, where to go in this conversation because there's so many things in, in the book. I mean, is there anything, where, where do you think we should start? I mean, I, I like the fact that you showed one, one main takeaway from the book is that trying to assimilate, trying to tap dance and smile and say thank you and please in your perfect English accent, trying to be as American as possible is not going to give Mexicans sp- specifically and Latinos uh, the agency that they want, the rights that they want. And the other great thing was like when, when Mexicans realized you know what, actually, why are we trying to be American? Why are we trying to fit in? We were here first. <laughs> we were here first. We were the civilizers, right? I mean, let's not, I'm not saying that the Native Americans were savage, but that's the American narrative. And if that's the narrative, that they tamed the West, no, the vaquero tamed the West, right? The, con- the conquistadores tamed the West, right? And so, no, no, we were here first. And we're not saying that we, like Mexicans, or Latinos deserve more rights than um, Anglo's, but we damn sure deserve equal rights with them, right? Yeah. Well, so uh, just going <laughs> back real, real quick. I I remember once hearing. Um, I think it was a scholar, uh, Arturo Sandoval Sanchez. He's a he's a Puerto Rican uh, scholar of U.S. Latino theater, and I think he once referred to himself. I heard him talk as a Border Rican. Because he, he hung out so much in the Southwest, right? So yeah. he thought of himself kind of as like this mix. Uh, so you, 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 you might be able to be a Puerto Rican, Hector. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, right, I think your, your, your wife has South Texas roots, too. She was born in Juarez, man. Somewhere. She was born in Juarez. She was a dreamer. <laughs> yeah, she came here yeah, when yeah. she was two. I mean, yeah, you know, I'm, I am a Puerto Rican. I, I love the border. And uh, I mean, I'm a Honduran. So now I'm more, more uh, aware of what's going on in the border. But Again, Mexicans are the majority of Latinos in the United States. So if you're a non-Latino and think you don't have to worry about or care about what's happening to Mexicans or what has, or what is the history of Mexicans play a Mexican's place in this country, then you're sadly mistaken. You're you're doing yourself a disservice. Yeah. Yeah. So certainly um yeah, I mean if we're looking at policy the way that we're thinking is right like the 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 anti-Mexican sentiment, the rhetoric is driving policy, but the policy is punishing, surveilling, deporting Central Americans, right? Yeah. Like you're saying that that's all interconnected there. Right. Um, Most people think, you know, I, I bet a lot of Americans think Honduras and Guatemala and El Salvador are states within Mexico, right? <laughs> Fox News did. Yeah. Right? <laughs> oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, I think in this book, uh, with, with the history of ideas and belonging, I did want to show uh, like that there are these these differences and these divisions, um, but I also didn't want to wipe out uh, the ability to make these larger connections either, right? Um, and so like there are important distinctions, uh, cultural, um, to an extent, even like dialects, right? Between Mexican Americans and Mexicans and Hondurans and Puerto Ricans, right? In the United States, there are important uh, differences and distinctions that, that we should acknowledge, right? But that there, there's also a shared experience of being kind of different uh, as well, right? That, right? that allows us to create greater kind of political or social uh, coalitions or solidarities. Um, and so, you know, I, I begin that kind of breakdown of, of Mexicanist ideas, right? Or a Mexicanist sentiment in the early 1900s into this fragmenting, we're real Mexicans, you are not, and then that loss of Mexicanness, what do we do with it? To growing into kind of the Chicano movement of them saying like, okay, yeah, we, we, we don't have to be this one thing American, right? Like we shouldn't, our goal isn't necessarily assimilation and, and kind of white English speaking, um, all that kind of stuff. In fact, you know, we can use this experience of discrimination and othering to not just build solidarities among, you know, undocumented uh, Mexicans in the United States um, and, and Mexican nationals in the United States, but we can grow it, right? So, that, you know, we, we in theory, Chicanas and Chicanos have solidarities with Cubans. Um, well, it's with, like Biden's passing that law or has that bill. He wants to give a pathway to sh- 
to citizenship to 11 million undocumented immigrants. And you, you get the, I sense by the way people talk about it, that they think everybody thinks that they're talking about undocumented Latinos, undocumented Mexicans. No, 11 million undocumented means I know undocumented Polish people. I know undocumented Russian people. I know undocumented people from Asia. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, just to, just to touch on that, I mean, and, uh, I, I lost my what, what were you saying? I lost my train of thought. There's so much. I mean, there's just I'm trying to like I'm looking at the book in my mind, and there's so much. Oh, oh the one thing I wanted to say is that you you kind of I mean, re- really, is it fair? I mean, this is more of a question. Is it fair to say that what happened to Mexican Americans or Mexicans in the United States is really what happens to every gr- minority group that tries to gain entry or tries to get its piece of power, American power, right in America, where like. Let's let's be super American. Let's say that I'm as American as anybody else. I mean, you see black people did that, right? You saw that, um, you know, that was the whole thing with, you know, the early black movement in, in, the, in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And after a while, it goes from that to black, oh, black power. No, no, black is beautiful, black power. And you see the same thing happen with Mexicans, right, where you have... The, the you have LULAC in, 20, in the 20s and the 30s and 40s and in the American GI uh, Forum, you know, saying, oh, we serve this country. Same thing as, as black people have done, Puerto Ricans have done. We've served this country. We're citizens. We're just as American. But then the 60s happen and we're like, you know what? No, we're actually different. And we're just rather than trying to fit ourselves into the shoebox of what your shoebox of American uh, culture, we're going to bust American culture, that identity or that definition wide open and say, no, we're completely different than what America's used to, but we're still American. Yeah. And there's, there's ways that I think um, Mexicans and uh, like Mexicans, right? Mexican nationals, Mexican Americans and, and other Latino groups have been able to navigate belonging a little bit different, right? In the sense that, right? Like Brown or Mestizo, uh, Latinos that are kind of white and indigenous have a racially ambiguous position, right? Mm-hmm. I think when you look at Afro Latinos, also you would think that maybe they'd come in, but, but because of those racial hierarchies that exist in the United States and kind of the anti blackness uh, of, of foundation of racism in the United States, kind of categorized folks differently. Um, and so there was that 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 way that like LULAC early on, um, and, and they've changed, right? LULAC in the twenties. 1920s isn't the same as LULAC in 2020, certainly, right? right. Um, uh, but in the 1920s, they were trying to kind of position themselves. That respectability politics relied on an anti-blackness to an extent, right? Saying like, okay, we agree that you can treat black people this way, but you can't treat us that way because, and, and what they called it was uh, the other white strategy, right? The mm-hmm. other white legal strategy that we're another white group, like the Italians, like the Poles, yeah. in many cases, it didn't work, right? It didn't work very well for them. But for much of that mid 20th century, that was their main legal strategy. Um, and so then well, to, to get to the Chicanas and the Chicanos, that's, I was trying to show in, in kind of that chapter four of, of, that, that it wasn't just like radical, like, you know, it wasn't like 1954, we're white. And then all of a sudden, like 1965, no, we're not. Yeah. Uh, it, it took a, it, it, it took a, it's still going on. That's still going yeah. on. Right. You still see the pieces of like white, white Latinos exist. Like it's 2021. Nobody knows that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So for, for lots of folks, you know, who were trying to claim like whiteness, as their way out of discrimination, in, in many cases they wouldn't. Since whiteness is a social construct, uh, there was also this this moment in history when folks were trying to figure out then what did we mean by white, right? And and so legally it was, it's kind of weird. Like other historians have written on like these uh, these early cases where they're trying to like legally define whiteness, but since it's like a social construct, they they use like a mix of like eugenics and pseudoscience, and then like. I can tell one when I see one, right? And so it's it's these prerequisite cases yeah. where you have Japanese folks and Indians, right, from from like India, saying you can't exclude us from coming to the U.S. or becoming citizens because we're white. And the judge is like, 
I don't know. And so both sides bring their eugenics arguments, right? Like they, they go and they reach their eugenics book and say, see, this one categorizes as white or yeah. Caucasian or whatever. And then another one, the other lawyer comes up and says, no, this scholar says you're not. And then the judge kind of has to like look and be like, nah, that guy doesn't look white. <laughs> you know? And that's uh, how they make their ruling. <laughs> they, pick, they, they hold up like a, one of those uh, paint samples from like Home Depot or Sherman <laughs> Williams. Like, eh, yeah, you're white. <laughs> you're all, you're yeah, eggshell. Like, you're eggshell. <laughs> yeah, it's like that meme, right? What is it when they were trying to decide if it was like a troubled individual versus yeah. terrorist, right? Like <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. That's kind of what they were, that's what they were doing kind of legally in the early 20th century. And, wow. and I mean, they, they, they try that. I mean, lots of folks are trying that well into the 20th century, including Mexican Americans, until they decide like this is this is hurting us. And I didn't get into that that case, um, but it's in about 54, 1954, uh, with the Hernandez v. Texas case, where legally they, they decide this isn't going to work for us um, because it, it it it's this case dealing with um, Mexican Americans serving on on the jury. Um, and so the kind of the legal historian Michael Olivas has written about it, but but they this guy kind of I think is drinking at a bar. They get into an altercation. They go outside, and Hernandez does kill this person. He's guilty, but the lawyers are trying to challenge it based on the fact that there were no oh, right. Mexican Americans on, on on the jury, uh, and so they they try to appeal it, and the judge says, "Well, you all have been saying." That you're white. <laughs> that you're white, and there were 12 white people there. Where's the your discrimination? Peers, you say hello yeah. to your peers. <laughs> exactly. So in this case, it backfires on them, right? And so in the appeal, uh, the lawyer goes out, and in in the in the in the law uh, or in the in the courthouse, there's the restroom, and there's segregated restrooms, right? And so the restroom has a sign that reads "colored" at the top, right? And then underneath it is a is a sign in Spanish that reads "hombres aquí." Right. And so the lawyers call uh, Gus Garcia at the time, calls the janitor onto the stand. And everyone's like, what's going on? This is absurd. And he is asking him about the bathroom. Right. And so he's proving that clearly we're, that there's discrimination. Right. That there's some there's a non whiteness to Latinos if you're sending them to the non-white bathroom. Right. right? There's there's kind of colored and hombre aquí. Right. And so they're able to win that appeal and go on to, wow. the, to the Supreme Court where they finally legally drop the other white legal strategy. Um, but lots of people are upset about that in 19, a lot of folks, you know, that, 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 that Supreme Court case was supported by LULAX and those groups. And the fact that they dropped that strategy, that other white legal strategy upset many folks. Um, but, you know, so, so that's kind of this challenge to we're going to be true and loyal American citizens understanding it as we're going to be like white folks, right? <laughs> um, and so I think I, I quoted some folks in there saying like, you must remember that through your veins runs the Castilian blood, the yeah. whitest, most you know noble blood of all uh, to once we get into like the 50s and 60s in, in kind of chapter four, I was, I was looking at how many folks start to grow frustrated with the explanations of progress and development. Um, and so there's there's a there's kind of a picture of the West Side Barrio in San Antonio in oh, the 1930s, wow. and then I have a picture of the West Side Barrio in the 1960s, and they're side by side, and you probably couldn't tell which one is which, right? And it looks and like it's is, like how people lived in the 1800s. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and, and so there's really no change, and so they're beginning. I begin the chapter with this 1968 Civil Rights Commission in San Antonio, where they're looking at kind of Mexican Americans and, and discrimination. And what they're reporting is is horrible, right? Low levels of education, high levels of hunger. Um, there's a famous documentary I didn't write about it in the book, but you you can find it on on YouTube. It's a 1968 CBS documentary called Hunger in America, and and the opening scene is an infant dying, and he died of hunger and malnourishment, um, and it's a Mexican American infant. And so it's looking at all these kind of impoverished groups in 68. It looks at Mexican Americans, it looks at Native Americans, African Americans, and I think poor whites across the country. But the first sections of Mexican Americans. Uh, and so you're thinking like between the New Deal and 68, it's like the high point of great society, you know, programs, the high point of American liberalism. You know, we now have four years of this war on poverty. And what did we have to show for it? Right. right? Like ideally things should have gotten better. And so it's 
it's when within that context, right, that these explanations about progress really start to get challenged in many cases. And, and folks, it's not that they like show up and be like, these are all bad ideas and, and they're racist. Right. Uh, I mean, some folks were saying that, but many folks were trying to actually use these solutions. We're actually trying to try out these policies. And the more they spent time with these ideas and these policies and solutions, they realized they're untenable, right? right. And in fact, they're not just untenable, but they recreate or they perpetuate our oppression. And that's when they start to, to shatter them, right? That's when we start to see those uh, in the books as I'm looking at it, these Chicanas and these Chicanos really engage that set of ideas in sociology and the social sciences and in other fields. Um, and it's not like they're opposed, they're adamantly opposed to them at the beginning, but yeah, when they spend time with them and try to apply them, they realize you can't. And that's when they begin to form these other ideas uh, that they, they begin to call like Chicana and Chicano ideas, right? And, but isn't that, isn't that the, I mean, writing about race is like, you know, bashing your head against the wall because again, race is a social contract, right? There's no such thing as race. We're all one human species. But that it's like saying, you know, le leprechauns are completely imaginary. That said, this is exactly what a leprechaun is and no <laughs> other definition is is allowed, yeah. right? And that's yeah. the kind of arguments that we're having, right? We're trying to, you know, I, I, I say it all the time because like, uh, and I, I want to talk to you about, uh, what was it, Barrio Cultural tra uh, Trans, or what was it? Barrio yeah, so Cultural. Yeah, so there's there's kind of Barrio Nationalism, and then I also had uh, like, a, like a kind of Chicano cultural transnationalism. Yeah. Uh, as I'm, well. I'm, and then there's a And I a figured, I, just group. reading about that, I was like, yeah, I'm a cultural transnationalist from the barrio, you know? So like, <laughs> you know, even there, you know, I don't fit in anything perfectly because like, you know, the 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 barrio uh, movement I agreed with other than the the conservatism, right? The traditional values of traditional views of, of sex roles and stuff like that and denigration of women. Obviously, I'm not for that. But I mean, I get what they're saying, right? That, that everybody in the it's a barrio nation, right? Everybody, we're part of a barrio. Every barrio is one nation, right? No matter what city you're from, when, no matter what part of your town town you're from, um, if you if you live in a barrio, you are one it's part of the same people as people who live in a ghetto in you know in in Shanghai or Hong Kong. I mean, you have the same worries, the same plight, the same kind of power on your neck. Um, and then of course I interrupted myself. So I, I, <laughs> I forgot what I was going to say. Um, what were we talking about the, about how, about how race, I was saying how race doesn't, yeah, was it, we were talking kind of about social construct and how difficult it is to, yeah, pin it down. Like it's a, it's a figment, but we also a figment that we're all familiar with its images, right? Yeah. Like and then, so the when the Chicanos are like, up. yeah, we're brown and proud, right? Brown berets and stuff like that. The you know uh, the the respectable Mexicans the ones that are trying to pass as American white American call them the new racists right call the yeah. Chicanos the new racists I love it I love yeah. it you know it's terrible but I love it because that's just how <laughs> ridiculous things can get and and the person who is well one of the many folks who were calling these Chicanos the new racists was was uh, Henry B Gonzalez right who's this uh, this this icon well in the 40s and 50s he's like this liberal icon in san antonio you know but he hates the chicano movement i mean he joins with the fbi and actively tries to destroy it like he is working with like COINTELPRO pro and like yeah like dropping <laughs> dimes on the chicano movement trying to explode it and he just dislikes all the chicanas and the chicanos um and so yeah like there's there's a sense that it was right, like the way that we understood like what happened between these folks who were happily calling themselves Mexican Americans, right, and then these younger folks calling themselves Chicano and Chicano. It wasn't what I was trying to show is yes, it was it was generational, right, but it was but it was also uh, much more multifaceted than that, right. Like yeah. even that generational schema that that historians had used um, wasn't you know, we had kind of oversimplified it, but also I was trying to show like the, the ideas, the, the kind of intellectual cleavages as well, right? The kind of larger ideological cleavages between those two with, you know, with, with uh, yeah, like, like these Mexican-American politicians and these activists. Um, but yeah, I, I think, 
your your comments on on you know I was worried about adding new terms in the book with with yeah like the the barrio cultural nationalism no, I loved right it. Yeah. and the and the and the and the kind of trans, cultural transnationalism um and the, and the feminist uh, cultural transnationalism. I was like, you know, do I need a new term or can I explain it differently? And well, and I thought, you know, those phrases best right. described it. Um, and so, you know, I, I wasn't, I hope I, I didn't come off too critical of that, of, of, of those folks who were conceptualizing the barrio. There were limitations. Well, I was critical of, of yeah. the kind of gendered aspects oh, of for it. For sure, right? right? You that, can't that be like, like, well, that's that's valid. No, it's not valid to denigrate <laughs> half the species, you know? <laughs> yeah, like these, yeah, right, elevating men and women are just supposed to be subservient and right. all that kind of stuff. I, I definitely wanted to be critical of that. Uh, but folks becoming aware that, that, saying like these folks this is our community yeah right and these are the folks that we're going to try to help uh that that wasn't negative that was actually productive in many cases because sure. kind of the focus the, the 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 focus of that set of ideas was on these kind of you know what what they called at the time vatos locos yeah. right like these and and there's not a great english translation i think i call them like street youths which is yeah. so right street like youths. It's, it's kind street of urchins. Best street urchins <laughs> pickpockets you youths. yeah I mean, but like if a... you see blood in blood out you know what a vato loco is right <laughs> if you see blood in blood out yeah <laughs> and so uh you know a lot of these these barrios in the west side of santos south side in tucson and LA and places struggled with, you know, minor gang violence, but also those gang divisions. But that barrio cultural nationalism then allowed them to kind of, we see a decline in gang violence at the time. And they start to realize like, oh, we're not that different, right? Like the divisions, like we shouldn't be hurting ourselves. Yeah. Um, the problems facing our community are different and we need to change to kind of protect them. And our toughness is what's going to allow us to resist police brutality, right? Like yeah. folks are scared of us. We've established that these, you know, the cops are scared of us. We've established that and they should be, but instead of now everyone in our community being scared of us, we're going to use that sense of fear against, you know, the, the system cops, the or the whatever, right? It's, it's, it, I mean, it's what we would call today, like woke, woke, you know, gangbangers, right? Woke gangbangers or woke, woke thugs, like, right. Because they're saying like oh, it's beautiful. They're saying like you know if if some some you know Mexican from a from a gang from from the other side of town comes into our turf, why would we why would we hurt them? Like they're just because they live over there. They're, we're we're dealing with the same problems. We need to we need to we're a brotherhood, right? We're a nation. That and that was beautiful. Other than the you know again the the the, the sexism and stuff like that. But um. Yeah. And I, Belonging's complex, right? And yeah. so they were getting the sense that, like, their con their conceptualization of belonging was a little bit smaller, was a little bit more limited to an extent, right? And so right. you get the the idea of, of of how you can how you can kind of grow or shrink that circle of connection in many cases, and and they chose for good reasons and bad reasons, or for better or worse, to primarily focus on on, on varios i think like the what, what i call like the cultural transnationalists i think they tried to, to yeah picture themselves in the world right and and that might be both you know from from like a writing point of view you know when i write essays i might be sympathetic to them right like right. i i see a connection as w with those folks who were trying to say like okay we could yes we're this but then we also get this sense of all of our connections as well right and and i thought what was really neat about them is is they put themselves at the center of the world, right? Like that was the way that in many cases they were challenging uh, white supremacy is that, you know, for so long, the, the center of, of everything was kind of like white men in right. many cases, right? Like the, the, the world revolved around that identity. And so they were, they were uh, kind of ideologically pushing that person out of the center, right? Pushing white men out right. and then setting themselves. And it had limitations too, right? Because many of them were men as well. And so in some ways they were still centering maleness or masculinity, right. but, but, you know, sometimes that was intentional and unintentional, but yeah, they, 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 they wanted to put themselves at the center of the world because other folks had too, right? Like yeah. no one criticizes, you know, no one criticizes Whitman for putting himself 
at this end of the world, right? He, yeah. he can say like, you know, do I contradict myself very well? I contradict myself, yeah, yeah, right? Exactly. He's, he's all kinds of things. And everyone's like, and when right, he did it, it was cool beautiful. Yeah, do, but when then he did it, it was beautiful. Like, whoa, 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 man. Right. When he yeah, does, when exactly. Whitman does like, it, it's beautiful. Yeah, tamales. he's, yeah. he's <laughs> subjective. He is the center of the universe. Oh, that's so beautiful. But if a, if a Chicano does it, whoa, 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 easy. You're on the, you're on the border yeah. of the world. You're on the edge of the world. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you can't set yourself there. Yeah, you, you know, yeah, you you can only talk about a certain certain topics, right? You can only code switch about, yeah, like or talk, know, about like or <laughs> talk about yourself in relation to whiteness. You can only talk about yourself in relation to whiteness, but you can't talk about yourself as the, as 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 a subjective person, right? Because I guess because in in the white world, in the white uh, mainstream consciousness, all non-white people are objective. Are objective bodies and they don't have a subjectivity to them the only a white mm -hmm. only whiteness is subjective right only it only it has subjectivity mm -hmm. yeah yeah and so i think i quote uh, there was there were in the book uh you know i i, I kind of it's, it's a big a bit of a mix of like literary history too and so yeah. there was some recovery going on and that there were some uh figures both chicanas and chicanos who are a little bit more known in the literary world um, right that I could have used and I and I intentionally left them out because I thought okay well maybe some folks might know them or, or if you're if you're not familiar with them it's easier to pick up a book and, and find them and then, so I was trying to find like these these less known folks to show that these that these ideas were really getting into places right like and so I didn't have to in all places worry about how good the poems are I mean, in lots of places they are very good right the quality is there but the quality as a historian as opposed to a literary scholar right you worry a lot about that quality however you want to define it as a historian i don't and so i just wanted to show like these ideas were so important that a convict in huntsville state prison in texas starts writing poetry right right um these folks all over the place start are moved to create right to create yeah. their own cultural productions and some of the quality is not going to be there in, in many places right we have great writers as well right. they are there um and so i was able to highlight some of some lesser known folks who maybe again from a literary standpoint aren't the highest quality but then i was also able to highlight some folks who who certainly had that kind of quality uh who might not be known and so i, I was thinking about like uh Bernardo Verastique in there, which is probably one of my, my favorite quotes where, where he talks about himself as, you know, like Atlas holding the world on his shoulders. And he's got a, a, a few lines in there that he says, like, I am, uh, I think I am flesh and bone and water. And I thought that was just such a neat way to, to talk about Chican, being Chicano and, Chican, and Chicanismo at the time, right? That I'm like flesh and bone. Uh, and water. And I, you know, just that line, right, yeah. I, I think is, is, is really great, um, but was trying to get at what those kind of transnationalists were doing is using their, their, their particularities to reach out in larger solidarity. And that's what you do with introductory history, right? You, you're basically mapping the evolution of ideas as they're imagined during different periods, right? So you're just basically pulling, you know, it, it doesn't really have to do with quality of the poems or the, or the stories or whatever. You just have to show that this is what people were, they were engaging with this idea. And this is how in the 60s, Mexicanness was thought of like this example. And then, but that's, you know, contrasted with how Mexicanism was thought or Mexicanness was thought, was thought of in the 20s example. I mean, that's, um, it's, it's almost like, it's, it's funny that an intellectual history isn't as popular in, in, in the history field because it's really fun to do and it's actually very straightforward to do right yeah it's i i think it's changing right i kind of mentioned that a little bit in the introduction because i do think it's uh, the history of ideas is interesting to, to lots of folks right once you tell them what it is the way that it had been done in the past maybe not so much right like it focused on uh, early on um, you know like puritanism Right. And so you got all these ideas about the Jeremiah and yeah. focusing on, on Puritanism and, and so and writing it as a kind of a certain way and or focusing on these uh, a specific set of intellectuals. Right. Of recognizing that there's only a group of folks who can be recognized yeah. what as the elites were talking about, philosophy. which is, you know, and, yeah. and, and now but now we understand, like, just because we know this from our own society now, what the elites are talking about and worried about is not necessarily what everybody else is thinking about and talking about. 
Yeah, or right, like what they are, what those elites are talking about, also regular people are talking about, maybe right. in a different way, right. right? Maybe not using that same language, right. but they're engaged in that set of ideas, um, which which was the goal, right? And so, uh, yeah, I, I think the the field of of intellectual history, the history of ideas, is 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 changing. I think there's a lot of new uh, historians of ideas who had the same i you know the same notion of of making it the field. Uh, much more accessible and looking at a wider range of people and sources and where you find ideas, right? In sports, in yeah. music, in, in plays and all that. Uh, so that's growing. Um, how many of, how many people of color do you have in the history of ideas, right? Like of, of people practicing that? Well, you know, there's all kinds of problems with higher education. So there's, there's not that many of us, right? Yeah. <laughs> They're engaged in that work. Um, and so that, that kind of makes it hard when, when you feel isolated, luckily, I, you know, there's there's some some great uh, Chicana and Chicano intellectual historians and, and, and folks uh, who, who I can talk to and whose work I, I, I respect and, and use as, as a model. But yeah, it, there's there's not a lot of us. So it is hard to get it out there. Um, and it's hard when it does have to be super professional. Like if I'm that, that so many folks depend on this for like promotion or for tenure, uh, right, that 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 makes it really difficult to write for a wide audience because uh, in in some of the places that we're not that we're at, it maybe isn't seen right. So you know, someone like um, uh, oh, I'm gonna blank on her name, right? Like the, the, there's there's plenty of academics um, forgetting her name, but she writes for the New Yorker off and on. She's a historian at one of the Ivies, and folks recognize the value of that. Um, Jolene Cobb uh, used to write for the New yeah, Yorker. Yeah, yeah, okay. I, I, she has a she has an odd name, right? Not to say that it's weird or anything. Just unique name. I forget yes, her name. Um, yeah, she, and she does great work. Yeah, right? she's yeah. and so she's she's an academic historian. But since she writes for the New Yorker, I imagine her university, her Ivy League, is like very well. We'll accept that, right? Yeah. <laughs> but and and I, you know, I think you edited a piece years ago that I wrote, kind of critical about the New Yorker. As much as I love the New Yorker, yeah. right? It was critical because they don't pick up U.S. born Latinas and Latinos, right? Yeah. Almost virtually everybody who they pick up to write for them tends to be a relatively affluent. Well, that's their Latin audience, American right? I mean, national. you can't blame them, and that's necessary, and that they have an audience, they have a niche. But Latino Rebels' audience is is not exactly the New Yorker. They may overlap. There may be a sliver of overlap, but when you're writing for Latino Rebels, don't act like, don't write as if you're writing for the New Yorker. That's all. That's my whole point. <laughs> no, I'm going to be stuffy. And no. <laughs> no, but I, but it's, it's valuable, right? Like what I really like about Latino Rebels is like, I don't have to use the explanatory comma as much, right? Like, like in this program and when uh with with julio on, on latino rebels radio i don't have to put the kind of explanatory comma as much yeah. as i would for other programs right like it and 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 so a lot of it is an intro like much of the stuff that that we might do for a wider audience is or maybe not wider right i might be meaning like wider audience <laughs> but <laughs> wow that's a good one that's a good one yeah wider audience usually means wider audience right <laughs> yeah i, I do I, for better or worse, right, you do have to introduce these topics, you do need to explain them, and you do need to invite them into a field that many folks aren't going to be familiar with. Right. What I really like about, yeah, writing for Latino Rebels and, and being able to come on your shows, I don't have to necessarily do a lot of that introing of things that, that many folks in these spaces, in these digital spaces, come with, with a you know, they've probably already taken a Latino studies class, or they don't you know, explain something yourself. Else like that. <laughs> yeah, they, they have a they have a sense of of what we're talking about already, um, yeah. so we don't have to spend you know fifteen minutes of of a program or something just saying like, oh, let me tell you what this means actually. Yeah, and I, I you know I try to with the podcast I try to have a and in my writing I try to it to be a conversation like with my writing I'm writing to. Uh, a friend who is, you know, that's the rule of thumb, right? You're writing to a friend who more or less is as smart as you are, you know, maybe less smart, a tiny bit, you know, <laughs> you know, again, I'm the, I'm the nerd in my group, right? So I'm, but I'm writing, so I'm writing to my friends. So I'm not trying to nerd out too much, but I'm trying to, you know, drop knowledge, right? And the same, and with the podcast, I'm just trying to have, present a conversation, right? I want us to, this, this show is for me and you. Now, we know that other people will watch and listen to it, so we might have to explain certain things. 
but really I want the audience to get a conversation between two people who I'm interested in your work and and the internet's there, right? If if they if you say something that they don't know what that is, right? Cultural transnationalism, Google it, right? Mm-hmm. Or buy, get the book, you know, get the <laughs> yeah. book, and then you'll know, right? And if you don't really want to know, then you won't know. Yeah, yeah, that, uh, yeah. Well, and so <laughs> if if I can ask you a question, Hector, for for a second, Shoot. you've done quite a bit of, uh, I mean, commentary and analysis, political commentary and analysis. But recently, I don't know if it's is a time thing, but you you've taken kind of like an essayist turn. I feel like most of what I've been reading from you is essays. Is there, is that on purpose or what, what, what are you finding? I'm uh, thinking, uh, I don't know. Is there, is there something that those essays allow you to do that sure. maybe commentary analysis doesn't let you do? Yeah. Cause we, like the essay I wrote today, right. How could I do that in an article? Right. How could I talk about Mexicanness? You can't talk about Mexicanness objectively. That's the whole, that's the other takeaway from your book, right? That Mexicanness is subjective, right? It's in the it's in the eye of, it's in the heart of the Mexican, right? Mexican is, Mexicanness is different for every Mexican, you know, depending on where they live and you know whatever. Um, and so there's certain things that you you know that um, you can't you can't uh, you can't put down in facts and who what where when why, but that doesn't mean that they're not true. Now I'm not trying to sound like a Trump supporter or somebody who's talking about truthiness or something like that. But there's just sub, there's subjective, tr- there's things that you can only talk about, talk around, right? There's no getting at it. I can only describe it. It's like, uh, I was thinking about the parable of like um, the, the blind men, right? Who come across the elephant and they're all feeling their, you know, this one's holding the trunk and they go, this is a snake. The other one's holding the side. Oh, this is a wall. One's holding the tail. This is a rope. One's holding the tusk. This is a spear. Um they're they're wrong but what they're describing if you put it all together they're describing an elephant right so i'm describing my part of existence my life my what i how i my relationship to mexicanness is it the ex- absolute truth no but take what i'm writing and take what everybody else take what you've written read read what you wrote read what i wrote and then maybe you'll have a fuller idea of what how mexicanness is being engaged with by people if that makes sense yeah i mean parts of yeah like again (laughs) parts of truth right is is it 100 percent truth truth? yeah if you put it together if you can begin to put it together i'm not god i don't know the whole truth right yeah (laughs) no but yeah i think the the essays are interesting because uh you know generally we don't there's not a lot of space for essay yeah. right for for latinx or latina latino essayists out there so I, i've really been enjoying um enjoying your essays right and so i was wondering if there was like uh if it was it was kind of a which is what me, i've been I, reading too right you know you read things and you read somebody you know I've, I've been reading you know i don't want to go through the list you you read a lot i mean you so i've been reading a lot of essays right and i and they they talk about Essays have a way of talking about truth that's not like a journalist, but they are a journalist, right? They're literally, I consider myself a journalist in that this is a journal entry. I'm telling you my thoughts and hopefully, you know, just like you, somebody will write a book about these times, what it was like to be a Latino in these times. And may, they might quote one of my essays, right? Because it'll give yeah. you a sense of what Latinos were thinking about, about latino Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I switched, uh, I think for me, I wrote, I've, I've written a couple of essay pieces, not in, in kind of Latino rebels, but in, in other places. And, and really I, I'm, I, for me, I was thinking it was just hard. I think in the last couple of years to write political analysis, Yes, you know, <laughs> like it's just, That's the other it reason I, yeah, real. Like... It, it, I don't know. It, I, I couldn't get, it needed to be done and I'd done it, in the, but it was just too, I don't know. I couldn't, I couldn't get there. And, and the essay allowed me to write. Yeah something about it without writing about it you know and writing and I, about, I yeah exactly yeah. right i'm talking about politics in this recent essay right I, in all my essays i'm talking about politics but the politics is not front and center it's couched mm-hmm. in you know my subjective experiences and what i'm thinking and the other thing is that writing about politics no offense to people you know it's important but for me everybody's doing it right and 
I've written about politics. You know, you know that I'm against the wall. You know that I'm for immigration. You know that I'm for healthcare. You already know what I think, right? Yeah. So that's a waste <laughs> of my time to go week in, week out and rehash what I think politically. Yeah, I think that was, yeah, that's that's probably one of the things too, is that sometimes you started feeling like you were writing, like for me, right, not you, but for me, right? Like I, I started feeling like I was writing the same yeah. piece, right? Like Just different versions this of poli- it. Yeah, yeah <laughs> this policy is racist because, you know, more or less, it was the same thing. Uh, I can't believe, you know, and it, it, it was getting, it, yeah, I think experiencing <laughs> it, like living through that moment and then feeling the same time, like, well, I keep writing this thing, you know, it was yeah. almost like you were like yelling into a boy. <laughs> but, you know, I had to go through that period because I didn't know what I didn't. I was young. I didn't know what to write about. So politics is easy for a young when you're young, you're radical. Right. So you're engaged with political ideas and you're very passionate. And so I have to write about something. I have to develop my writing. So I that I use politics as, as practice. And to look how I bring it around. Maybe this is why I'm a host. May, is it? Is it fair to say that that American Mexican Americanism, you know, it got it got ditched in the Chicano movement, right? But even the Chicanos seem to to admit that it served a purpose, like with people like Henry uh, B. Gonzalez. Yeah, like he's he was a legendary figure, and thank thank everybody was thankful that he did. You know, he was there in the forties and fifties, and that he did all those things. But by the sixties and seventies, it's time for. A, n- a new phase and so is it fair to say that Amer- mexican americanism even if it's you know denigrated today trying to be american trying to be you know trying to fit in trying to assimilate it served a purpose in the 30s 40s and 50s and then it and then it uh it gave it gave mexicans the chicanos the right to come along you know the the confidence to come along and say okay we're done with that we've proven that we're me- american now we're going to reown our, our, our separate identity as, and call it Chicano, you know, talk about Aslan, all that stuff. Yeah, well, so it, it certainly is Mexican-Americanism doesn't go completely away, right? Like Henry right. B doesn't, doesn't, he keeps his position, right? He, he serves well into the 90s. Um, and so it, it doesn't go away uh, in many cases. And in fact, lots of folks in the community itself wouldn't call themselves Chicanas and Chicanos. It was, it wasn't, you know, 90% weren't calling themselves Chicanas and Chicanos, but it, it was a much smaller percentage, but it was really important. Uh, and so Mexican Americanism certainly doesn't go away and we still don't see it. Right. Uh, and that's, what's really interesting. I mean, it's, that's, what's really interesting about an intellectual history or a history of ideas is that it's, it's it's easy to kill a person. It's hard to kill an idea, right? Oh, I it's, love it. I, I, I love die, that. Yeah. People die, but ideas don't. Um, and so it's they're they're there, and and it's easy to pick up ideas in different places and and take them and and change them uh, a little bit. And so yeah, I think if if we look at those organizations, right, lots of folks claim the Chicano movement failed because so many of its institutions don't exist anymore, right? Like there's not a La Raza Unida party. Uh, there's not a lot of these uh, organizations. There's no, you know, there's no more Barrio Unido, those kinds of things. Um, but there's still like a LULAC. Um, there's still a Mexican American Legal Defense and Education Fund, those kinds of things. Um, but, you know, the, the Chicano movement changed a LULAC for the better, right? Mexican Americanism, is, right, like the, the a lot of those ideas um, are still around, but but altered, right? Like that 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 taken on a bit of of those Chicano critiques, or right. answered, or tried to 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 supply a bit of a response to those Chicano critiques. Right. Uh, and so you see that a little bit in 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 the eighties, right? The decade of the Hispanic. There's you know there's there's an attempt to to yeah say okay we can do these Chicano things, but also can how do we make it mainstream? How do we make it um, consumable, right? Yeah. Uh, so s- subsuming it to capitalism for better or worse, right? Um, and so you see the success of some of those things, right? Uh, you see something like Zoot Suit, which I wrote about, which was like a Luis Valdez play. Yeah, I read it, yeah. Uh, and, uh, and then becomes a movie and it, it's kind of a well. It's the first Chicano play on Broadway it gets ripped apart. You know, um, they just they hate it, uh, and so it, it 
gets off Broadway relatively quickly, then gets turned into a movie, doesn't have a lot of success, right? It's, it's, it's not a kind of a beloved, iconic movie that everyone can quote. Um, it's, it's no La Bamba, right? right? <laughs> Which again, <laughs> like the same people involved. Now La Bamba, right? Like that's, that's it, right? <laughs> like lots of folks, not just Mexican Americans, but many well, Latinos if you're young, you would say teeth. the Selena movie, right? You the would say Selena the Selena movie, movie. which is interesting yeah. that a Puerto Rican's playing a a, a, tijan, a tejana there. Yeah, that's interesting, right? That's transnationalism <laughs> right there. Well, and I, you know, I haven't written it, but I, I got an inkling of an idea that the the Selena series on Netflix, right? People have not loved it. It hasn't won as much critical acclaim as say the Selena movie, but I think there's a sense because. Uh, because there was there was definitely something Chicana and Chicano about the Selena movie, right? Like the yeah. director and the producer cut their teeth in the Chicano movement. And so when they were writing it, you get a much more consumable mainstream Chicanismo, right? Like, uh, but but very much that set of ideas, right? You you get uh, you know Eddie James almost or Edward James almost who yeah. also cut his teeth but you can't he, you go know, wrong he, there <laughs> yeah you get his his speech you know uh you got to be more Mexican than the Mexican more Americans than the American right like the, the all those beloved lines yeah. those are very much kind of ideas from the Chicana Chicano movement right yeah. um and this new series is not yeah. <laughs> right it kind of it falls flat in in many cases but yeah i mean what what happened to the chicano movement and some of those ideas it is tough uh you know i i had mentioned it but i think only because it's, it's a good example of right when when like national council la raza changes to unidos us one of the reasons they say is because we went and talked to a lot of young people the latino communities become much much more diverse, right? It's, well, it's still 60% Mexican descent or Mexican origin folks. There's a whole lot more people than it was in the 70s and 80s, right? But also just young people don't connect to any, right? There was a big disconnect among young people to like the ideas and, and probably the rhetoric, right? For, for for good reasons and sometimes bad reasons between that. And so they yeah. said, it's it's okay for us to pivot away from that that kind of stuff and so the the lasting his like the legacy of those ideas well some of us lots of folks don't know the history of that but but it's also it's 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 on shaky ground right, right. like even in our moment we're we're trying to struggle with what the legacy of it right the meaning of something like the chicano movement yeah i mean like you said you know people die but their ideas live on right in the chicano movement the people you know corky gonzalez all those people are, are gone Chicano, you know, I mean, you can't talk about Mexican culture in the United States today without talking about the 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 movement, el movimiento, right? The Chicano movement, right? And there's kind of, it was kind of like a dialectic. There's kind of like a dialectic between the idea of American and Mexican, right? Whereas before the Chicano movement, Mexican American meant American, an, a, a Mexican who was like an Anglo American. Mm -hmm. After the Chicano movement. And like you see with uh, Unidos USA and all that stuff, Mexican Americanism comes back, but now it's changed by the Chicano movement. So now it's Mexican American means a, uh, an American who is Mexican. Not that they're like an Anglo American, but that American now means something bigger than it met in the fifties. Yeah, that they could be. Yeah, that's a really good. I think. I think that's a really good explanation. That it. Could, it yeah, before it was. Yeah, like primarily American of, and then Mexican American after the Chicano means you can be both, right? Right, and lots of folks are like, oh, that makes sense, right? Right, right. Um, and and so yeah, I think that's but you needed the really Chicano movement for that, right? You needed exactly, the Chicano movement, yeah, for that. yeah, and it gets a little bit messy. You know, I I talk a little bit in in the conclusion of of where, you know, where's kind of belonging getting mapped out, right? That that you did have like the decade of the Hispanic or like the nineties you know, where we're, somehow they were going to be, right, like Latinos were becoming mainstream, and then you get into, but right under the surface, right, you have this kind of anti-Latino sentiment crop up, and then you get kind of this frustration of, well, we tried all these different ways, what are we going to do now, right? Like if, if that we're American, true and loyal failed, and then the Chicano, you know, brown, uh, brown is beautiful, Chicana, Chicano power didn't work, uh, kind of the 
Hispanic consumer identity was was elevated, right? It became ascendant yeah. in the 80s and 90s. And now we're starting to see like, what's that going to entail, right? I think I kind of couch it in, um, if, if you like the term or not, like neoliberalism, right? Like a, yeah. it's a liberal neoliberalism, but but what do we do about it, right? And, and I kind of showed in, in, in the... Um, in the LDC's attempt to, to think about uh, Latinos as like a GDP, right? They call it like the Latino GDP. And so here we have this idea of like the nation, right? That's how we measure a nation's productivity and GDP. But this isn't a nation within a nation of like internal colonialism or Atzlan, like the Chicanos talked about it, or a Mexico de Afuera. This is a purely kind of almost like capitalist understanding of, of why this community is valuable and it's not because you know they're they're it's almost not because they're socially valuable it's just because they have dollars like their social value is because they have this many billions of dollars to spend and i i get why an organization like that might want to promote that idea but how successful is that going to be right Right. (laughs) to to reduce these people to like dollars spent and then they're turning away from you know like the 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 state um, to, to corporations more or less. Right. It's almost like in the fifties, it's, you know, Mexican Americanism is like saying uh, Mexicans, you should, you should be happy that Mexicans are here because we're American. We serve in our country. We, we have American values. And now it's like, you should welcome Mexicans and Latinos because uh, they're good for capitalism. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. exactly. Yeah. I mean, I think you get, you know, you, you, yeah, you see those changes, you know, you think of uh, the Frito Bandito ad, right? Like that's the way they used to. And then you kind of switch it to like, you know, Coca-Cola putting like the old English on their bottles or something to try to get Latinos or having, you know, the NFL have like <laughs> Latino month or whatever, yeah. you know what I mean? But yeah, it's, it's, it's exactly that kind of idea and how, I don't know how successful, that's kind of where I left the book of it, even in, you know, my political commentary and analysis uh, because it's I guess working itself out as we speak right like we're living it how successful is that shift right like I don't know sure the NFL I I mean I don't watch football right but the NFL certainly does have like their I think they do Hispanic Heritage Month right I know the NBA has like you know Latino night right where like the Bulls are Los Los Bulls right yeah yeah and so you know that the NFL certainly had that thing but think about like its position on kneeling and black lives matter. It wasn't great. So how successful is it? Right. Like how successful are those, are those kind of programs or policies or strategies? Um, and, and what does it mean if now it's it's kind of creepy to, to connect human worth to economic value, right? (laughs) Yeah. The more economic value you, you can, you potentially have that, that is a measure of your human worth, right? About, about how much we're going to welcome you into our community. Yeah. I mean, certainly you, right. Like you can be super critical of that from like a super leftist perspective, right? Like that's crass capitalism, but you also see that it fits in even with our ideas right now of, of, you know, like thinking of yourself, not as like a person anymore, or even as Ooh. an identity, but as a brand, as right? A brand, like, yeah. Now you're a brand and then you have to monetize things and all right. How did we get here? (laughs) Orwell must be doing fucking backflips in his grave, man. (laughs) (laughs) And so, yeah, what does, what does that mean for belonging in, in, in the 21st century? Uh, You know, I don't, I don't, it's messy. It's, it's super messy. and, And I don't know how successful yet Latinos as, dollars like our belonging purely based on consumption is, it's ugly as, as it doesn't feel nice strategy, it's yeah i mean so belonging before belonging as like this kind of uh spirit or essence right like if, if i'm thinking about back to the book if we begin the 20th century as like mexicanness or belonging as as this kind of like ethereal spiritual or be right like yeah. essence um changing to right like citizenship as belonging and that not working right yeah. to to now we're getting into the 21st century as belonging as consumption or belonging as as money it was, I don't it, it know. was your your belonging was in your heart in the 20s and 30s and then it then it's in your documents 
mm-hmm. and now it's in your pocket, right? Now it's yeah. in your wallet. <laughs> yeah. That's crazy, you know. Um, and then, and then, Mexicanism and Latinoness and belonging is going to change when United the United States eventually becomes a a you know the biggest group is Latinos. I'm sure that ev- the whole calculus is going to change. Yeah, well, and I I think you see. Some folks describe right, like, and and for good reason, um, kind of being critical of of like white Latinos, right, getting an undue um, attention, right, like they're that it's always kind of lighter skin Latinos who get roles and get picked up in the media and that kind of stuff. But you also have like the messiness of right, like that Latinos and Latinos are one of the the highest groups to outmarry um, in the United States. Uh, and so a large portion of folks are out married are, 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 are parts of interracial marriages, right? Or interracial um, unions of some sort. And so their children are going to be, it tends to, the majority of those interracial unions between uh, Latinos tend to be like white folks, yeah. right? And so their kids, myself included, are going to be half white, half Latino. What does that mean? What's that going to mean for whiteness? Certainly, right? Like, are Latinos I love going it. to follow I love the way it. of There's a lot of, of trouble Italians? coming. I love it. <laughs> are they going to change what, what it means to be Chicano? Or I don't know if my kids are going to use that term Chicano. And then I don't know. And then what's that going to mean for even just, yeah, like the term American, right? Is is it possible to rehabilitate that term, uh, which I think is what some folks and some activists want to do, right? Yeah. Like they, But is it, I don't know. Uh, when I'm optimistic, I think that, yeah, maybe you can rehabilitate it. But sometimes when I'm more critical, I, I don't know that the, the, his, the, the racially exclusive connotations of that term American are, yeah. you know, have such a long history. I don't know if you can rehabilitate it. Especially when, you know, one side is is the one that's predominantly waving American flags. And that's why I try to present myself. I'm, you know, I'm a patriot, right? Do I... Do I love the government? No. Do I love American racism and American capitalism? No. But I'm an American. Why can't I? I want to fight for this country just like they're fighting us. They're fighting, you know, and you can take they for whatever you may want to think. They are fighting us over the idea of America, right? And we can just give up or we can fight them for, you know, fight them over the idea of what American means, right? And I think that's the responsible thing as a citizen, right? It doesn't belong to any race. Race is a social construct. It's imaginary. It doesn't belong to white people because white people don't exist. Uh, they exist politically, but they've they've made themselves exist politically. It's just a group of... I don't want to get into race, right? But um, the other thing I was going to... You know, just before we wrap up, um, what, what was I going to say? I mean, that... The, the other, you know, tying economic value, tying human worth to economic value is, is, is problematic. That's my academic word. Um, it's problematic. We, we might have to unpack that because in the, in light of American racism, right? Cause like, that's why, that's why it feels icky to tie Latino worth to the, the, the potential consuming power of the Latino market, because we know that the, the economic playing field isn't fair. And so if, if the system is saying you guys are only as valuable as, as, as much money you bring to the table, and so make as much money as you can and be as successful as you can, that's all well and good if, the, if there's a fair playing field, but there's not. So that's, that's saying, here, you need to do this for us to respect you, but we're, we're going to do everything in our power to keep you from doing this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, it would, I guess, it. <laughs> I don't know if it'd be any less troubling, right, uh, kind of belonging or identity as as your economic value, right? But it, it would certainly be a little less troubling if everybody was on an right. equal economic playing field, right? But we know that there's these built-in structural inequalities uh, that if not addressed, yeah, are going to perpetuate those same inequalities. And again, yeah, if, if, if we're saying you're only worth as much as you make, well, there's real structures that keep Latinos from making as much. Um, so that, yeah, again, that's why that's, that is so troubling. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> we're laughing because we're so 
fucking worried, right? Like we know that there's a mess. We're in a mess and we know that it's going to get messier. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Laugh because you can't cry, yeah. right? Like laugh, laugh because it's, it is, it's absurd in a yeah, horrible it's way. Absurd. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I, I enjoyed the book. I mean, it's a, it's a really important book. I think, you know, people, you really have to get, uh, you know, keep, keep going on podcasts and get this out, this book out here. Cause I think people, uh, they might, you know, mistake it for being a, a, a textbook, but like I said on, on Twitter, you know, every, uh, Latino, even if you're non-Mexican, but every American, you know, if you live in the United States, you should read this book because it'll give you a better understanding of the country you live in. Um, if, if, what better reason to read a book than that, right? And, and, and um, let everybody know the name of the book, where they can get it, where they can, where they can follow you, man. Oh, thanks uh, again. Thanks, thanks for those those uh, compliments. I'll I have I have trouble taking compliments, but me I'll too. take those. Yeah. <laughs> it's the socialist anarchist in me. You know, I got to be humble, no ego. But if you have no ego, then you know all you are is ego. So you have to have like enough ego to be a human being. You know, but uh, it's a struggle. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I, I I I'm glad that 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 you felt that it was accessible. I, I really did try to make it accessible. So. Um, yeah, if, if you want to get the, the title of the book again is, is Homeland Ethnic Mexican Belonging Since 1900. Uh, you can order it directly from the press's website, which is the University of Oklahoma Press. Um, you can order it off of any of those big box stores that folks order their books. And then uh, your local bookstore, of course, uh, would be would could easily order it for you as well. Um, and, and so you could support those those local bookstores. One last question. When when do you think we're going to see a Mexican president in the United States? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Another episode? Or what? That's you know, I uh yeah, I was Julian Caster, I was I was uh supportive of him, right? Like early on I was like, "Yes, I got to vote for him in the primary." And and he stumbled out of the gate. He did it he didn't start out great. I think he got stronger. Uh, as a as kind of a speaker, right? Like a president has to be a storyteller, and and I think he didn't do. I mean, he's still struggling with connecting on that storytelling level. His policies were great, you know. His his analysis of what's wrong was great, but I mean, look at he, you know, he he had to drop out of the primaries. He got less than what was it like one percent? I mean, yeah. it was it was pretty bad, and and so lots of folks were looking around saying like, why didn't why didn't he resonate? And that's been true. Um, of of other previous uh, you know presidents or presidential hopefuls, um, so when's the next one? I don't I don't know. I guess you've got I don't know if I think it was it was a Lat I think it was a Latino political consultant. His name was Mike Madrid, who who for a while uh, worked for for the Republican Party um, and has since left the party. Uh, but but he used to he used to quip he wanted Democrats to run on California right like that's easy to defeat if you run on California and so I'm thinking if we're looking at the pipeline of talent you know California would would be it you know you had Vesera and you had a couple of other folks there's some have, interesting things happening in Texas right I mean Texas is is Texas turning blue what's going on right I mean we might see it from there too right. Yeah, and so Texas certainly is uh, interesting. Hopefully, uh, I mean, you know, I, I, Cruz still has presidential ambitions. I guess that could be it, right? Would we see a, a Republican Latino president? I don't know. Will we see a Mexican-American one? Yeah, I imagine it'd come out of the Southwest states and just with clout, it'd have to be California or Texas. Texas, there's, there's a lot of interest. Yeah, certainly there's a lot of interesting things happening in places that we don't traditionally think uh, that that it's happening right so i think lots of folks think certainly san antonio and then think south texas and the big story that surprised folks was that uh, even though he lost the latino vote trump's percentage of latino votes in in south texas kind of clicked up but if you look at where the real big population growth of latino voters has been it's been in places like houston and north texas and those folks tend to be younger they are very much younger and they're skewing much more liberal, even though they're not being contacted, right? One of the reasons why they're not being, they're not participating as much as there's just been a dearth of outreach. 
Um, and so there's been some organizations and folks who are really working hard to connect and contact, connect with and contact those those young people. And they've been fairly successful. But yeah, so if you're looking at at, at kind of Houston um, and, and the North Texas area, there's there's some really interesting things. I don't know once you move on to higher office, um, there's folks who have ran for like local office and then state or for kind of houses in, in kind of a, in, the, in the state house. Um, we still haven't seen anything serious at, at the state levels, like statewide, right? right? So as a senator or something like that, I don't know what the, I mean, the Castros are, are the most known. I mean, their I mother was a Chicana activist, right? Yeah, Rosie. Rosie was 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 part of La Raza Unidad, and, and you know the um, for she was part of an organization that was for Barrio Betterment. Um, and uh, and his Spanish is like kind of almost, you know a little bit better than mine, which is and that's the that's the Mexican American uh, Latino American experience, right? Your your mom could be a hardcore Chicana activist, and then you could barely speak Spanish, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and I think that's where he kind of loses that storytelling because yeah. there's so much, uh, so many aspects of his life that resonate and connect with so many folks, right. but he hasn't found a way to make his story connect uh, in many cases. Like if you, you know, like again, uh, I'm a fan of him as a politician, but if you read his memoir, you know, the the obligatory presidential memoir, right? You have to write one before you run for office, and when they're good, you know, they're like Barack Obama's audacity of hope or something yeah. when they're not great and his was was not great i mean he missed every storytelling opportunity there but yeah he, he talks about you know like growing up eating fideo and all this other stuff that, that plenty of mexican americans would would connect with um but yeah sometimes he misses it but hopefully you'll see uh you know some some influential latinos climb the ladder i think you you're starting to see some important appointments outside of, you know, just running Latino communications in, in, in yeah. <laughs> political campaigns, right? Like before it was, you are Latino communications or our Latino strategist, well, we need which a is important. We need a... <laughs> yeah. I mean, those positions are important at the time, you know, right. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, those positions were important. Now you're seeing high level people in campaigns who are Latino, but are also overseeing the entirety of campaign so that yes, they still have like a Latino director or outreach, but it's, it's built more into the campaign. And so we're there now in this last, in this last primary, I mean, you see, you, you saw a lot of top notch political talent in those campaigns and those folks are, are going to keep, yeah, hopefully fingers crossed climbing the ladder. And that's going to, that's going to be really important. And I get. think the Latino youth is very politically active and and they're all about, hey, we're going to vote. We're going to take this country over by marching, by protesting and by voting. And that's, you know, you saw in the last this last election, Latino uh, voting uh, turnout was above 50 percent. I think it was like in 60s or something like that, which, you know, hopefully that continues. I mean, especially if we're, you know, if, if we're going to be the, the, the what do they call it, the minority majority or majority minority group. We got to vote, you know, um, and it's not about, you know, best revenge is not always your paper. Like like Beyonce says, sometimes you got to just vote and and do everything that you can do. Right. Whatever agency, whatever power you have, flex it. Right. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Well, well, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Everybody go uh, pick up Aaron's uh, book, Homeland. It was a pleasure to read. Um, something that I'm going to revisit, you know, cause there's so much going on in there that I'm going to, you know, when I'm writing in the future, I'm going to be like, okay, okay I'm going to, you know, there's those, those there, there, there's those books packed with so much information that you pull in from the shelf whenever you're writing in the future. Cause it's a, it's a resource too. And the writing is accessible. So please pick up this book, do yourself a favor, guys, pick up this book. Thank you, Aaron, for so much for coming on, man. Have a good weekend. Great. Thanks for having me, Hector. Peace.